Welcome everybody to another episode of Lunching with Lawyers. Peter Cousins started articles in 1959, yes you heard right, and practiced law until 2015. He was admitted to practice in 1964, so close to 60 years in the law game. Much of his years of practice was spent on the Gold Coast. In later years he travelled across Queensland helping distressed farmers mediate with their banks. He is credited with writing the official Farm and Rural Legal Service anthem. He is a great fan of the goons. He writes poetry, knows the Christmas bunyip, who he often invited to the annual Christmas party, was a show dog judge for many years and has 20 ageing ponies that he's keen to send to a good home so he can sell the farm and move closer to suburbia. Peter, I can see we are going to have fun. Oh, it's always fun. <laughs> And with me to interview Peter is my good friend Fiona Muirhead, who's who's my semi-regular co-interviewer. Thanks, Fiona. Hello, Loretta. Hi, Peter. <laughs> it's lovely to see you both. Um, so, Peter, can you remember writing the Farm and Rural Legal Service <laughs> anthem? Yes, I can, uh, and I, I think that I may have written also the uh, <clears throat> well, not the legal aid anthem, but uh, one for the uh, the civil. Justice Justice part, yes, uh, but I unfortunately can't remember how it goes, but I know it goes to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and uh, <laughs> what, 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 what better than that, really and truly? I think we need to add that these were the unofficial anthems, not the <laughs> official anthems. <laughs> I think they should... Possibly it's good that they're lost in time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they were actually not irreverent at all. They were very respectful. Oh, well, it was uh, stirring. Yeah. I mean, the battle hymn is very stirring, and these were intended to be stirring. <laughs> and uh, and intended, you know, it, intended to uh, stir, stir us all up about the good work we were doing. Yeah, ignite our passion. <laughs> Indeed. And so, Peter, I'm going to go back, even though it is a long way back, um, and to ask you where you went to school, actually. Oh, well, I wasn't going to mention that, but uh, yes, I, I went to the Church of England Grammar School, now now called the Anglican Church uh, Grammar School. And uh, after that... Uh, in Brisbane. That was in Brisbane, that's right, that was in Brisbane. And, uh, well... 558 was the last year there, 5850 is our, uh, is our uh, year, uh, <clears throat> we, when, we, when we had a 50 year reunion, uh, and uh, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do oh. to earn a living, no, no idea at all, I, I, I loved French and uh, sort of art subjects and uh, wanted to do something with that, but uh, I think my parents could see that this was a bit stupid, and uh, after after we tried to uh, find something for me, we went to vocational guidance people and whatnot, and they said, "Well, you could be a journalist." And I didn't like the idea of that. I didn't thought that was pretty boring newspapers, or you could be a school teacher. And uh, the parents didn't think that was very good. <laughs> so, was so the next well, I don't know, but the the <laughs> next thing was uh, my mother said, "Look, we, we're going to see the uh, uh, we're going to see the family solicitor who happened to be." Uh, my uh, grandfather's cousin, uh, we'll go and see him and see, see see what he can suggest. So he went along there, and unbeknownst to me, that was a it was a you know nefarious plan to uh, make me uh, become an article clerk and do law. Uh, I had nothing, no idea at all about what the law was all about. Really, I understood it was a very musty, boring sort of profession. Uh, however, uh, I was sort of taken aback because. Uh, Sort of the opening words when I got in there were, well, Peter, you'll have to have a good memory and you can't go around telling everybody what you did today because that, that's that's not in it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a very ethical sort of profession. Uh, you've got to be very, very careful. And, uh, well, there we were. The next thing I knew, I was a, an article clerk. The idea was that I would, should take five years articles and do the uh, uh, law boards course. But... Uh, <clears throat> Various people, fortunately, I think, got hold of me and said, no, you can't do that. You've got to go to university and do it there. I didn't know you could do law at the university. I, I thought that, you know, it was something else. Well, I, I'm mm. actually surprised about that, Peter, because I actually thought you couldn't. I, I didn't realise that there was a, that you could go to law school at that particular time. And I thought if you did five years articles, you you just had the solicitors. Was it the solicitors? Solicitors board, board? yes. The solicitors board mm. exams. You did an, an intermediate 
and uh, and a final, I think it was. So where uh, did you go to university then? St. Lucia, Brisbane. Yeah. And, Queensland uh, University. Hmm? University of Queensland. University of Queensland, St. Lucia, Brisbane, yeah. Um, in those days, which I was in favour of, mind you, you had to do several arts subjects, notwithstanding that you weren't doing a BA. The LLB contained several arts subjects, so I did English for a year, I did French for two years, and I did political science for a year, and I, that, that took care of the art subjects. Mm. And then we... it was just the boring, uh, the boring uh, <laughs> law subjects. Uh, Should we explain what article clerks are? Article clerks, well... Because uh, they don't exist anymore. Really? Don't they exist? No. Well, article Haven't clerks... Haven't done since they yeah, brought okay. in Okay, the... well, um, well, it's articles of apprenticeship, really. Articles uh, refers, I think, to the uh, uh, document or the transaction, yeah. uh, and uh, that's really what it was, an article, uh, articles of apprenticeship, uh, an agreement as to apprenticeship, by which you uh, you said you uh, wouldn't steal the postage stamps and uh, not uh, destroy the firm and things like that, and your father said he'd... Uh, He'd uh, provide you with a bed to sleep in and the uh, master and articles to whom you, you were articled. My or, articles all, yeah. were so old that they contained a clause that you were to undertake to wash regularly. <laughs> I don't remember that one, but I do remember reading that you could not pinch the postage stamps <laughs> and that my father had to provide me with some lodging. Because yeah. that's how poorly yeah. you were paid. Yes, they I, were drafted in the 1800s, yeah. these documents, I think. I think it was three pound ten. I'm not sure. I think it was three pound ten. Uh, was the uh, was the wage? Anyhow, it, it wasn't intended to, uh, you know, provide everything for you. However, it was, you know, and interesting. So was that, a, was that a generalist practice? It was a generalist practice. Um, I don't know whether we ever did any criminal law. If we did, it was very. Uh, it was only for established clients that mm. somehow needed it. Uh, it was a generalist practice, yes. Um, my master in articles, I won't mention the firm name nor his name, but my master in articles was a, a pretty sort of a whiz-bang fellow at uh, company law. He was always uh, uh, amalgamating people and uh, and uh, doing big things and being chairman of directors of, of the companies that, that he amalgamated. Anyhow, it was it was very big there, and it uh, had a lot of conveyancing and estates. I, I really think that estates were about the only thing that I ever learned how to do while I was doing articles. Uh, it was very Dickensian. I mean, you know, uh, you, you you heard what um, you know, Gilbert and Sullivan. I swept the windows and I uh, well, I cleaned the windows and I swept the floor and I polished up the handle on a big front door. Well, there was another article clerk with me. Uh, we had to clean the bloody fan. <laughs> and uh, I don't think we ever swept the floors, but we uh, got people's lunches, we ran errands, and, uh, you know, you were office boys, but mm. possibly a bit higher than office boys. But not much. Not much. But it was drilled into us that it was a very ethical sort of a thing. Mm. Um, you couldn't advertise. I mean, I'm absolutely horrified now by the advertising that goes on. I agree. I, I, mm. I remember very well um, how... Uh, <clears throat> I think it must have been when uh, when we uh, my particular year uh, was admitted. Uh, the uh, president of the Law Society said that we were not to have any uh, any sign which indicated that in that place there was to be found a solicitor. Oh, really? That's right. So you couldn't even. Oh, no, you 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 could have your name there if yeah. someone if someone wanted to find you. You were allowed to have your name there so they could find you, but mm. you were not allowed to have, except in small letters, the fact that you were a solicitor because people should not be able to go along the street and say, ah, there's a solicitor, we'll go in there. You couldn't do it. And why was that, do you think? Like, why well, to that extent? Because Well, this, was, people... this was Dickensian, mm. I suppose. Mm. Again, I mean, I, I <laughs> you know, also remember that one day when I was going down George Street to uh, file something at the Supreme Court, I think, uh, there was some radio station advertising from one of the shops in George Street. We're not there, we're not there anymore, of course. And uh, he happened to call out as I walked past, Hello, young fella, you know, where are you going? Or where are you from? I told him. When I got back to the office, my master in articles had received a number of telephone complaints. You're kidding. I know, no, no, that's right, that's right. <laughs> However, look, you know, that's 
That's how it was. Wow. Um, can I was just going to ask you a little bit about university. So you did two years of French. What's your French like now? Ah, uh, I, I can read French very, very well and possibly speak it quite well. But my, I think it's got something to do with my hearing. I cannot understand what my wife says, and she doesn't speak French. So what? <laughs> so what hope have I got? You know. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. And is that when you became a fan of the goons during your university years, or was it um, after that time? No, it was before university. It was mm. while. Uh, it may have even been well uh, before I even went to uh, to secondary school. <laughs> I can remember we used to sit around the radio uh, in the place next door and listen to you know goon records and things like that. Now that that was a long time, a long time mm. ago. Because you, you've really that uh, did um, the goons sort of inspire your comedic side? Maybe, uh, maybe. I, I mean, I, I've enjoyed the theatre over the years, uh, and I've got to thank the law for getting me into that. Uh, I, you know, I was introduced to the University Dramatic Society by mm. people in the law in the class, and uh, and then of course I don't know whether you ladies re remember uh, Tony Skyen and John Hellman, and also uh, 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 Jim uh, Thomas, uh, Jim Thomas, Jim Thomas, um, you know, all, all of whom had distinguished careers on the bench. Uh, they uh, had put scoop together. Scoop mm. uh, a review, which I was fortunate enough to take part in, and uh, you know, uh, and, and you know, thereafter, I've always had an interest in in theatre. I've you know done a lot of production and and acting too uh, on the Gold Coast and and in Brisbane. Uh, that that all that all stopped a number of years ago. Now that I don't know when that stopped, but uh, bef you know, before I got to legal aid, that's for sure. But, I've uh, always thought of you as the Australian Spike Milligan, and I still have in my office a book of Spike Milligan poetry that you gave me. Hmm. I don't know if you gave it to me or I just didn't give it back. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the one that um, that uh, has the it's got a uh, yellow cover. I know. Is, it, is this the one with the with the fairy characters? Uh, I think in so. It? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you also gave me "It's a Weird Mob" to read. Oh, Which yeah, I yeah. really, really enjoyed. Yeah, is yeah, that okay. by Spike Milligan? No, that's no, um, that was um, I don't know. Uh, th that, that that was um, they're a weird mob. Yes, they're I know. Weird. I'm just uh, for trying to think of his made-up name, but uh, I can't. Yeah, I'll Fiona will go and look it up on the internet for us. Um, while while she's doing that, I'm just going to ask you this question. So, you've already told me one of the strange things about practice back in the fifties. Yeah. about the advertising um, mm. restrictions. But what was it like then before computers, touch type typewriters, interconnected phone systems and mobile phones? Oh, very normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, it's all a bit different now. No, uh, well, of course, I, I, I thought that was all quite normal. Uh, mm. And, uh, gee, the, the poor uh, stenographers, typists, had to type out a lot of bloody things, the very long documents, leases. Uh, it was only uh, only some years after I'd been in there, I think, that uh, people started using photocopying as a means of uh, putting documents together. They also had to be very accurate. Oh, tremendously accurate. Tremendously accurate. I, I would have spent hours uh, checking wills and leases over yep. with uh, ladies in the office. Yep. I've been oh, and then having to retype the whole documents if there was an error. Now that's well, that's an exciting sort of, thing. Yeah. To, an exciting thing to do is to read a lease <laughs> for <sorry>. errors. <laughs> um, that was one of the first things I did as an article clerk. It drive you crazy. It wouldn't suit me. I'm not <laughs> an attention to detail lawyer. <laughs> well, I, I I had absolutely no idea what all these documents mm. were all about. Uh, I, I had in the back of my mind that a deed was a sort of a document that uh, people signed and, and might have had some sealing wax on it or something. Uh, and one day I was instructed to go into the strong room and uh, and get someone's deed. So I went down there and I couldn't find anything that looked like what I thought it should look like. 
So I came back upstairs with an insurance policy, which I thought was the closest thing to it. But uh, what they actually wanted was a certificate of title. Mm. So well, I struck out badly there. Mm. <laughs> uh, I had no idea. Yeah, no, well, no idea. Well, how, what idea do you have at eighteen years of age, or seventeen yeah, years of yeah. age, when you when you started those articles? Well, particularly when I didn't really want to be a lawyer. No, well, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're not unusual there. Most of the mm. people that I've interviewed never thought of law as a career that they yeah. were going to go into. Really? Okay. Yeah. Mm, it's a really common thing. We all get trapped into it <laughs> and oh. never get out. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. What else can you do? Yeah, uh, yeah. But you were admitted in 1964. You must have only been 23 or something like that. Oh, well. That must be it, mustn't it? Yeah, mm, yeah. About that age. And yeah, yeah. that was already, your son was already born and yes. Sean and he yeah. attended the ceremony. He did, yeah, 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 yeah. That would have been quite, well, one, to get married so young. It seems so young now, doesn't it? <laughs> and to have children that yeah. young. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know. People, people did it, <laughs> including me. Possibly yeah. even younger. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, uh, goodness, they, you know, there weren't there weren't too many in the law classes either those years. I mean, there were uh, sixteen of us that uh, graduated, wow. I, I believe, uh, and uh, I think of them, uh, sixteen, not of the sixteen, I think six finished up on the bench. So it was, you know, a good rep, a good representation from our year. There were no women in our year. Yeah, I was going to ask. No you. women, but but we did have a couple that uh, attended a lot of our lectures. One was Quentin Bryce, who of course became Governor General, I believe, and uh, the other one I think was Nada Haxton, who uh, uh, was a barrister or became a barrister, I think. But I don't think we had any other women. And they weren't in the law degree. They weren't in the program. They were just coming along to. No, do they, they they were doing they were doing a degree. They were doing law. But uh, they must have been a year behind us or something like that, I think. Mm. Uh, but but no, nevertheless, do, uh, doing various subjects which we were also doing. It was all, well, it was all bloody interesting. Oh, I, look, I, I want to tell you about uh, one of our fellows, one of the people we who graduated with us, Sir James Killen, uh, who was a little bit older than, than we were, but... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Sir James used to tell this as a, as an, in his after dinner um, speeches, so I'm not having a go at him. Uh, during our course, uh, Professor Walter Harrison set us a land law problem, and uh, you know everyone was thrown in the deep, and away away everybody went. Sir James, Jim. You know, I thought it was a bit bit too much for him, and it was indeed. It was too much for any of us. Uh, so Jim went to Sir Garfield Barwick, who was a, a, a you know a compatriot of his, and who of course was uh, the uh, Chief Justice of the High Court. And uh, was he Chief Justice at the time? I don't think he was. I think he may have been Attorney General mm -hmm. then, and, and later became Chief Justice. I can't quite remember that. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, he got his opinion. And he sort of basically presented that. Uh, so, Sir so James got, or, or Sir Garfield, if you like, he got three out of ten. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I've never, I have never emulated this feat again in my life. But I got nine out of ten, and that was apparently quite unheard of. I don't quite know how I got well, to that, but uh, doesn't that mind. show that you were smarter than a? Uh, well, I called yeah, Chief well, Justice yeah. and a member of part wasn't he? Yes, he, he was. He became yes. a member of the federal government. Well, you may think so, but I I don't know whether that would be correct. All right. <laughs> it know. was just a one-off lucky. It was one-off lucky, lucky, but you know, it was it was pretty it was pretty funny. I mean, everybody thought it was a bloody scream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that is a scream. So, when you finished um, articles, you went to um, a law firm in Surfers Paradise? Well, yeah, what? not long afterwards, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what prompted that move? Well, more money. More money. <laughs> the That's need right. to earn an income. Yep, yep, that, that, that was what prompted it. And uh, I 
shouldn't have been running that office. Uh, in fact, I don't think I was. I think that the uh, the good lady who uh, who was there as my assistant was really in charge. She knew what she was doing. She knew she knew what had what had to happen. But however, there I was, and it was a a marvellous time. Uh, in those days, surfers was a hell of a lot different from it is now, and a lot more relaxed. And everybody wore very casual clothes. And uh, your clients would sort of walk in in thongs from the beach with a towel around their shoulders and uh, all this sort of thing. It was, it was really, a, really a, a tremendous way to practice. However, I mean, that did change. Well, what was the stress like then if you were, like you said, you would have been very junior and you were yeah, running very an junior. No, I, I made a lot of mistakes too, I think. Mm. But uh, I think somehow the Brisbane office and uh, everybody... Made, Thank you. Fixed them, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't know whether I got terribly stressed with it. I don't think I knew anything. I probably did. Well, I didn't know I was making mistakes. I suppose. Isn't that something that we learn? Well, that's something we try to tell young lawyers starting at legal aid these days. Is mm. everybody makes mistakes? As soon as you come across the mistake, tell somebody more senior. There's very little that can't be fixed, and if it can't be fixed, there's insurance. But the idea is to get mm. get people to just not be afraid to come forward. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, I probably didn't come forward in most cases because in most cases I didn't know I'd made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you get that? I mean, how, that's pretty extraordinary to get a job Client, like Clients that. would complain to the Brisbane office mm. or something like that, I think. I think that's yeah. what would happen, yeah. But, I mean, but it's pretty extraordinary to be given such a position at, such at a relatively young age, and they would have known what articles were. Yes. Like. Um, okay. Well, I the, the the firm that I was with had a very big finance company practice, and uh, I spent a couple of months in the Brisbane office, going a couple of days a week to surface, and uh, somehow I demonstrated a knowledge or uh, or an idea perhaps of what uh, of what uh, finance uh, finance practice was all about I, I know I wrote an opinion on something and uh, they were reasonably happy with that I understand it and they uh, they must have felt that there was something in my brain other than uh, sawdust eh? I don't know but I think obviously they felt that I wasn't a complete dummy. Mm. So were you acting for lenders down there? Not so much down there, no. The Brisbane mm. office was, was, main, mm. it was mainly a, a family practice yeah. at surfers. Mm. Mainly conveyancing. Oh, standard. You yeah. wouldn't want to get that wrong, though. And I, I was not encouraged to go to court at all. I did a little bit, but I wasn't encouraged. Mm. I was discouraged from going, <laughs> yeah. And so you stayed there eight years. Can't remember. Yes, probably about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, about eight years. And in that time, is that when you became a commissioner of declarations? Because I remember you well, had I a big stand. It was actually a notary public. Yeah. Uh, and no, it wasn't during that time. Uh, I, uh, I, in fact, I went to the Brisbane office of that firm for a year mm. and was enticed back by another firm on the coast and went back to that firm. Mm. And uh, it was with the, uh, whilst I was with that firm that I became a notary public. And a notary public, what are they? Well, I think it's a glorified JP, someone to witness documents. That That's how uh, I think the, you know, people would look at it, I suppose. In, um, in times gone by, it was more of someone who could draft a document for you and uh, do things like that. Didn't you uh, have some international acceptance as Oh, well? yes, there's, yeah. there's all of that. There's international acceptance. There's, uh, you can do strange uh, strange things with uh, banking documents, strange things with shipping documents. Uh, mm. Yeah, and you can, uh, that's right, in international stuff, I had, we had a lot of people who would come in with uh, uh, documents from overseas and uh, hopefully they would have a translation. And you'd have to 
attest to the fact that you were not learned in a particular language, but you've, but this apparently is a is a true translation, etc. It it was quite fascinating. Some of the stuff I never got into the uh, very deep things that notaries could do. But uh, however, um, well, why did you get it in the first place? Because there was some right demand for it. Mm. There were a lot of people. Um, there were, you know, a lot of international people, uh, particularly on the coast, and um, people from interstate, New Zealanders, uh, particularly New Zealanders, a lot mm. of Kiwis, and uh, they were often needing notaries to ah. to certify documents or to witness documents, and that was mainly what it was for. And our notary publics can. Can they, do they have to have a law degree to become a notary public? Can you remember? Uh, mm. I think in practice you do these days, but uh, because you you, uh, you have to be recommended by the College of Notaries. Uh, but I don't know whether you, it, it was not always quite. necessarily so. Uh, uh, you, you, did you, you, you'd seen that big screed, screed that I had? About well, I did see the screed, but I didn't How read it. I was it. A, a, a person... Uh, you know, residing at Jumboomba, which was meant to be Jim Boomba at the time. Oh, really? Yeah, well, you yeah. You lived at Jimboomba for yeah, a time. Yeah, and, uh, you know, beloved to God and all the rest of it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and it, yeah, and uh, you had to get, I don't know how many people to sign something to say that they thought you'd be okay. Mm. Uh, and also the blessing of other notaries. And, uh, and lastly, I think... Um, Judges, I think I think I had to have a couple a couple uh, there say I was okay, and then and I finally got sworn the, in for a judge. Yeah. And who did you get to be your judges' referees? Don't remember, but I know that uh, I know that one of the hangers, uh, who was then a judge, um, um, swore me in. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I've still got the seal here. <laughs> Lovely <laughs> using the seal. Very impressive for clients to bring out your big seal and. You know, crunch their document up with it. <laughs> yeah, no ceiling wax. Um, so you were just saying you were living in Jimboomba for part of that time. Is mm. that when you first started to get on the land? Because it seems strange that where you ended yeah. up, which we'll talk about, but yeah, uh, you've you've sort of moved towards the country. Yeah, yes, mm. that that was that was right. That yeah. was the first time you lived. Yeah, and yeah. how many? What sort of property were you living out there? On in Jimboomba. Oh no, much. It was only ten acres. Yeah. 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 Ten acres is. Ten acres and a few horses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. a few horses. Is yeah, that that's all you right. Had? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we were both Annette and I were both, uh, you know, a bit keen on on riding in those days, and mm. uh, then later we moved into the miniature horses. But we weren't really there for terribly long, I don't think. But. Uh, it was during the time that we were there that I decided I couldn't stand this private practice anymore. You know, I couldn't stand all this ambulance chasing, as they call it, and uh, advertising, and how you had to entertain people, you had to live in people's pockets. Uh, networking. I couldn't stand it. Eh? Networking. Networking, that's right. Commercial networking. Net networking and uh, rain making. Rain making was a popular expression. You what was make, that? I've never heard of that. You to, oh, you had to make rain. Well, so that's when you get a really big client, isn't it? Well, possibly, oh. but you, you had to get them in so mm. it would rain upon your coffers. Anyhow, oh. anyhow, I uh, I then left the practice of which I was then senior partner and uh, thought, oh, I'll get a job pretty easily, bloke like me. Uh-uh. No one was interested. I did a few odd jobs here and there, uh, spent a few months here and there with people and... Uh, uh, the longest I think I spent was a firm in um, in Brisbane, an old and very old and respected firm. I was doing mainly lease work there, and uh, unfortunately, something happened, and the uh, the firm uh, was dissolved. And uh, anyway, after after some yeah. months, I, someone suggested to me that Legal Aid wanted someone for their uh, uh, sort of country practice, so to speak, and uh, I fronted up to Colin. And Colin Marshall. Colin Marshall. Mm -hmm. And Colin said, uh, 
look, uh, I can't uh, tell you you've got this job, but don't take another job, eh? So, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, and anyway, the, there we are. Colin Marshall was the head social worker at Legal Aid, and I think it was Colin's idea to start the Farm and Rural Legal Service. Is that correct? It was. Also the uh, women's... Uh, Legal, legal service, service. Yes, yeah. yes. And Colin actually has a farming background through his wife. Yeah, yeah. Um, she owned, or her family owned Tabinga outside. Marvellous old, marvellous oh, property. Yeah, yeah, property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they were, it was through his, um, well, his, the relationship with his wife and contact with Tabinga that he became aware of the struggles of farmers in relation to mm financial stress and dealings with their banks and it was his idea I think to start the Farmer Rural Legal Service. Yeah. So you would have been one of the first lawyers to be employed. Is that right? To what? To be employed by the Farm and Rural Legal Service? Oh I was. Uh, mm. and they also had um uh Lee Neverson, did they? Well well Lee came in a little bit later. It was um uh Thompson uh David? who was David? No, no, he he was up. He was in Townsville, or Rocky. Or it might have been Townsville, mm. and he had a promise that if he if he came if he came down uh, to work, they'd give him the Toowoomba practice, and uh, I I would have to go to uh, Rocky or whatever. So uh, he was there for I don't know how long, maybe a year or more, and uh, then he stayed with legal aid. I went to the bar and uh, with the criminal practice. And uh, Lee Neverson came. Mm. So that? maybe we should explain what the Farm and Rural Legal Service is. So, yeah, tell well, us about well, it. Well, it, it, it was a service uh, to help struggling farmers uh, compete, I suppose, with their banks. Uh, they were getting tipped out of their properties. They were getting the... Uh, they were getting their property sold up because they couldn't pay their mortgages and Queensland did not have any legislation to uh, to help them whereas New South Wales and I'm not sure where else did have uh, you know farm mediation mm -hmm. legislation which meant that you couldn't go tipping farmers out in these circumstances unless you went through certain mediation procedures well Queensland didn't have that but uh, Colin and uh, whoever was in charge then of the uh, uh, farm uh, financial councillors, there were quite a few of them around throughout Queensland, both Commonwealth and State, who were there to help farmers yeah. in struggling. For sure. Well, Colin and uh, the gentleman, I won't mention his name, who was there, um, sort of concocted a, uh, well, a document which uh, a lot of banks, most banks, agreed to, and it provided for a, for a mediation procedure. Was that the Queensland Farm Finance Strategy? It was. Mm. It was indeed. So I didn't realise that Colin was involved in the drafting of that strategy. That's interesting. Because it was, because it was very new. Mm, gee. It had, it had only just sort of come in. Mm. And, and it formed the basis of the practice of doing mediation with banks for farmers and yes. bank, most banks signed up to it? Yes, there were some I think who didn't but I can't remember who they were but uh, yes, most banks did. I'm wondering if it was one of the Queensland banks that didn't sign up to it. <laughs> oh, I think there, there, may have been, there may have been some and, 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 and not, not all would agree always because mm. it was a voluntary sort of a thing. So why was it a good strategy? How did it work? How did it work? Well, if the farm financial councillors and the two of us lawyers who were in, what was it called? It was called the Farm Finance Service, incidentally, mm -hmm. in those days, which I thought I always thought was misleading. If we couldn't sort of sort it out with the bank, then we could require or request them to come along and... Uh, have some mediation and uh, you usually got a result if you did that. Hmm. It wasn't necessary all the time. Most of the time you could work something out. 
And I think the the attraction of the Queensland Farm Finance Strategy and the difference between it and the new legislation that came in in 2017 was that it had quite a um, sophisticated pre-mediation process, Mm. whereas Mm. a lot of the focus now with the new legislation is just on the mediation process itself. And it's not about trying to resolve the matter before that yeah. formal mediation Well, you, you, you know more about this than yeah. I do. Um, but, yes, there there were a number of steps and procedures yeah. you were supposed to go through with. Uh, this name, the farm, uh, the farm Finance Service, that they call it, yes. as I said, was misleading. I never liked it. Uh, and I know that uh, at least one solicitor acting for a bank wouldn't talk to me because he thought I was a... Finance sort of, company. Yeah, he, he didn't realise I was a, uh, a solicitor. I, I tried to say that, you know, I, I... Look, you know, you can talk to me. Solicitors talk to one another, but no, he, he wouldn't talk to me. Anyway, I wanted to, to change the name and, uh, well, we asked John at the time... Uh, Eventually, then That's it became John Hodgins, who John was the CEO. Yes. Then eventually, it became the Farm and Rural Legal Service, which I, which I thought, and, and Dennis, who was there, uh, thought was more appropriate. Mm. Mm. Dennis McMahon joined the service at when was 2000. that? Two thousand. Mm. Mm. Or two thousand. Yeah, Lee yeah. Lee Neverson at that stage went to the bar. Mm. And well, you weren't based in Rockhampton, so did you buy property up in Rockhampton? Yes, yes. Mm. We we had, uh, I think it was about 300 acres, had a few cows. If, if you lived up there, you had to have cattle. Yeah. It was, <laughs> you know, compulsory. You had to have cattle. Especially if you were a farm and rural That's legal right. service yes, lawyer. Yes, you had to know something about it. And I really enjoyed seeing, you know, mainly cattle people, graziers. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed seeing them. I loved seeing the animals and, uh, you know, learning about them. And, uh, I think actually that's one of the things about the Farm and Rural Legal Service that has worked so well is that the lawyers were encouraged, permitted and enjoyed travelling to on mm. property to talk to the farmer. So it, not only did it show that you understood the commitment they have mm-hmm. to their land and they can't take too much time off and to travel to talk to the lawyer mm. is a bit of an imposition, it was part of the service that you would actually go out to the property, which meant you got to actually see what was happening, which is often what the bank wasn't doing. That's right, yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the bank went out, they often didn't realise what was happening. Mm-hmm. Like in, uh, oh, well, there are a lot of stories I was told about how the bank simply did not understand that uh, if you got, uh, if you, got uh, you know, 20 mils, 20 mils of rain or something, it didn't necessarily mean you'd be able to, uh, your, your, all your troubles were over. <laughs> Yeah, and things like that. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed all of that. And uh, one of the most enjoyable things was the uh, uh, was the dairy uh, uh, work that I did when the, uh, uh, when, when the act, now I can't even remember the act, uh, was uh, about, was became revised and then was going to uh, have a sunset clause in it. Uh, and I spent a lot of time on the uh, Atherton Tablelands with all the uh, dairy farmers up there, uh, learning so much about dairying. And uh, basically what I was doing for them was appealing the uh, uh, rights that they had got to produce so many litres. This was all overhauled. They were, they were, they were allocated a certain... The quotas, number of litres, that's right, quotas, quotas, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I don't know how many people I represented, um, but, uh, you know, she was a breeze. Uh, and were know, they paying compensation for that? No, yeah. they, they weren't paid compensation, no, no. I mean, it, it was it was all a waste of time as it turned out. I mean, I, I, I won all the cases that we that I took. It was mm. a, the Dairy Industry Tribunal. Oh, really? heard the uh, heard the appeals that was composed of a uh, uh, of a chairman who was a barrister an industry representative plus a uh, plus a, a special counsel plus a mm. QC special counsel whatever they call them SCs these days uh, and uh, you know you argued your cases just like a, a normal a normal court case your witnesses and your cross examinations mm-hmm. then uh, then uh, a detailed argument uh, at the end and you know I used to stay up I'd 
basement of cans at the time. I would stay up until the wee small hours of the morning uh, with my uh, laptop and whatnot, researching uh, researching cases. There were a surprising you know, number of cases on, uh, uh, you know, administrative law and uh, whatnot, which was what we were going on. And uh, anyway, look, it, it all turned out marvellously well at the time, but then uh, later on, uh, Later on, uh, uh, there was a judicial review because the uh, tribunal had not, in fact, given uh, proper uh, proper notice uh, to uh, all the dairy farmers, and uh, they had not, you know, had the right to uh, be represented themselves to argue against it. So, never mind. It was all oh, very enjoyable. So I don't quite get it. So. You were arguing that they shouldn't have these quotas. In well, quotas. I was arguing today that the, the, the people I acted for should have increased quotas. Yeah, increased quotas. and But they also lost ultimately because they weren't given the proper notices. Not them, but no. other, other farmers. The farmers yeah. Not everybody, not all farmers mm -hmm. appealed. All oh, right, okay. The ones that had not appealed uh, must have whinged at the end of it, I suppose. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, on review, on digital review, it was decided that they had not been given proper notice that if they did not appeal, they might lose some of their quotas, mm. Mm. which they did. Mm. But ultimately, of course, uh, that was all swept aside. And, that, and yeah. ultimately, um, we have a decimated dairy industry because yeah, yeah, most yeah, people yeah, exited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So were you around when they were exiting, Peter? Oh, sure, yeah, but... Um, I guess after after all that was over and it, the whole process took a few years, uh, uh, I uh, guess I didn't have anything more to do with the uh, dairy industry. I've, uh, interestingly enough, I've uh, seen a couple of them on uh, some of those ABC programs, and uh, hmm. some of them have you know diversified and are doing quite well, quite well with with other things. Hmm. Anyhow, that's that's fine. I think one of the things about the Farm and Rural Legal Service was that, um, yes, you had to have an understanding of the law, but you really did need to understand, you do need to understand the industry. Mm. And that's one of the things I noticed about Dennis. He understands live exports. He understands quotas. He understands... Yes. Dennis, route, was, Dennis, he Dennis did a bit of farming himself and yes, his family Dennis were farmers. Yes, so done he, a bit of farming. He knew a lot about it. Mm. Yeah. Or knows a lot about it, yeah. Mm. It must have been a steep learning curve for you, though. Sure, mm. it was. Because also even to get the job in the first place, because you wouldn't have had that farming, you know, that interaction with farming no. background. No. So well, I guess think? I was lucky. Yeah. Yep, lucky. And, and what was the difference between what you think of the clients of uh, the Farm and Rural Legal Service, so to speak, and the, uh, the clients that you had in private practice? Oh, well, I, I think I may have said this before to other people anyway, that uh, at Legal Aid, I was acting for people who had a need and in the commercial practice, I was acting for people who had a greed. <laughs> yes. That's about, that's about it, yeah. Mm. And that's what made you really dis... Because you were... Like, to give that all up after 20 years of practice and as a senior mm -hmm. partner, it must have been a really hard decision. Oh, it's probably stupid, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I didn't like it. It was mm. everybody was too greedy, soul destroying in a way. Yeah, oh look, mm. well that's how I thought of it. But and it is interesting. I'm I'm going to be speaking to someone else in the next few weeks who's had a very similar experience as you, and has left, lost his job when they're older, mm. and said it's very difficult to actually get employment. He, he's gone and set up his own firm to get around that too mm. because mm. once you get to a certain age, they... 50 was mm. too old. Yeah. I, I don't know what I was, a bit over 50, 50-something, mm. uh, I think. There is, though, something to be said for an older practitioner, particularly I would have thought with farmers, um, that they are more likely to connect with you <laughs> Um, <laughs> given their own age, given their own yeah, age, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there weren't. I don't recall too many young farmers. No, that's no. right. Yeah, and also I think there's a certain amount of because with farming work or with any client work, really, 
It's about how you build the relationship and trust Mm -hmm. and to do it so quickly. And I think, well, I certainly think I'm a lot better at that than I was when I first started out of practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a real benefit of having someone who's been doing the work for many years because that is one of the most important things about the law game, so to speak. Well, legal aid is so different from private practice. You yes. have a, you've got a lot of people, well, first of all, it's aims, you know, you're acting for needy people, like, as I mentioned, but the people at Legal Aid, I thought were marvellous. They all wanted to help. Uh, you could go and ask people for advice. You could, they were all friendly. Uh, <laughs> the other it thing, wasn't cutthroat. Although they do have their need for you to, you know, be time effective and, you know, meet your income. I don't think people realise that Legal Aid does have income targets, um, but what they will allow you to do is, particularly with the farmer and legal service, was the time to travel so that you were meeting mm. with the farmer mm. on his property, and which is something that I think a private law firm couldn't really afford to give the time to, but the difference it made actually going to the property to be able to talk to them was time and yeah. is time well spent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I hated in private practice. I hated justifying costs because I, I knew how much money I had to make, and uh, you couldn't make it unless you charged accordingly. And it was unfair to clients. What you were charging them was way above, I think, what it was worth to them. <laughs> but you couldn't you could you couldn't survive if you didn't charge it. I think it's just such an expensive legal. Legal services are very expensive because they're still quite time intensive. Exactly. It takes time yes. to do the job properly. properly. Yes. yes. And yes. I think this is the thing. You can cut corners, but that building relationship, especially with farmers, because mm. otherwise they won't trust you. Mm. And mm. you won't get a good outcome at a farm debt mediation if the farmer doesn't trust you. The pro- yeah, and, yeah. and the fact is... Not so much even so that they own the um, own the outcome of the farm debt mediation process, but that afterwards they remain okay with what decision that they've made. If you just come in and say, "Well, you've got to go off to mediation. These are the consequences if you don't, you know, make a decision now," they're not. They're going to think you're part of the machinery that's tipping them out of their property. Yes, I think you're correct there. Mm-hmm. I think you're correct there, and uh, yeah, it uh, yeah you took things pretty slowly. Yes, uh, actually, it was a little bit like, in some ways, um, early practice on the Gold Coast. You uh, couldn't just rush into things with people. As I said, mm-hmm. people would come in in thongs and bathing attire, and you had to talk to them. Mm. You know? I think the Farm Rural Legal Service is also one of those. Um, services I think was possibly maybe one of the early ones probably family law as well where you actually learnt to work with another discipline and in this case it was the financial counsellors mm. and it's a very important working relationship to support the farmer and, mm. and that's teaching you to deal with these days I think you deal with agronomists and financial counsellors and accountants mm. and all sorts and, of and it's actually a more holistic approach to mm, the mm, representation mm, of the mm, client. Mm, 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 mm. We meet private lawyers sometimes mm. because yeah. we're very, we're quite focused in what we do. So we're not yeah. going to go into subdivisions and how to subdivide or property. Or estate planning. Estate planning. Yeah. Estate planning is such an important thing. Um, mm. Succession planning. Mm. Um, so yeah. we're much more likely Always. to be yeah. involved yeah. in that. Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. a really interesting area of the law for sure. I don't know how much Dennis does with all that side of things now or whether he's just mainly interested in mediation or can only be focused on mediation, but uh, I did spend quite a lot of time just giving general advice to people, which we could do, uh, although it didn't show up much on on our costs, I suppose, for legal aid. Mm. But um, I spent a lot of time in interviews with people about general things including mm. estate planning and including other problems which were connected with farming but not necessarily because they were going to get tipped out by the bank. Mm. Well, isn't that 
an important part of the work at Legal Aid is that you may be representing somebody for their NDIS appeal or their farm and rural legal service debt, um, you know, uh, finance debt or whatever area that you're practising on. But we also have, an, I think, an educated role for the client because you have an opportunity to give them a better understanding of where they sit within what area of law you're dealing with. And probably what you were just saying then is like mm. general information that mm. they could then go and get specialty um, mm. advice from somebody else, but to open their eyes up and start thinking or giving them more knowledge. Yes, yes we, yeah. we had to, or I, I had to. I, I presume Dennis and Lee were, were much the same, but I, I had to point out to people that I couldn't go and represent them in such and such a, a field, but I could give them some advice and tell them, well, if you want to get such and such a done, you must well, go and you, see a private lawyer. Too. Loretta does this, says, well, look, these, yeah. are, these are things, here's some questions you need to go and ask somebody yeah, about. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. So often telling them this is what you need to be asking and going mm. to the specialist to mm. get the advice. Correct, yeah. Because I'm doing that work too. Are you? Excellent. Mm. Yes. She's not, Loretta is our new farm and rural legal service, one of our new farm and rural legal service lawyers. Are you travelling? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, good. Um, I have, COVID sort of... I've been out to a few farms. I've been on a, uh, what was it, a ha big harvester. I went, yeah, I went oh, and wow. travelled along on the, the tracks. Tree, eh? I've been to a cane farm. Um, I've been to a fish farm. <laughs> oh, great, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm trying tremendous, to, yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. I'm learning, like you said, you learn a lot about the whole practice of farming. Oh, the old cane and farm, yeah, yeah. The cane farming is very interesting. Well, I, I was... See, I went to some cane farmer up up north, and uh, they said, "Oh, well, you've got to come, come and have come and have lunch with us." <laughs> and uh, the lunch would have suited a a banquet for legal aid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow! So, <laughs> an Italian an Italian lunch. How was it? Oh, wow! Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't do any drinking at that lunch. <laughs> actually, no. No, actually, no. No, I, I probably would have if it had been there. I shouldn't have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right, now I'm going to, um, because it, we've sort of been very serious, but the thing is legal aid was also fun. And I remember a story that was recounted to me. I thought it was by the CEO, um, a previous CEO, who said he'd visited you in Rockhampton or maybe it was the deputy CEO, um, you met him at the airport, but when he went to put his bag in the back of the car, you informed him that it might be not such a good idea given that you'd picked up roadkill on your travels for the dogs. Oh, uh, yes, well, I... Uh, I can see it now, yeah. blood dripping out of the office car. <laughs> you would have fit right in with those farmers. So. <laughs> did that really happen? Well, only, only half of it, I, I did... Uh, pick up some roadkill. It, it seemed to me that uh, that uh, the uh, wallaby or kangaroo uh, would be well suited to sitting in the uh, senior solicitor's chair. <laughs> I, I thought that uh, I thought that this was the uh, uh, yes. However, look, uh, I, I took it out before I got it upstairs. <laughs> To the relief of all. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially the senior solicitor. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> it was a different workplace <laughs> in those days. <laughs> uh, that wasn't too long ago either. <laughs> um, I see. Uh, and the other thing that, of course, we always, you introduced Fiona and I to the Christmas bunya. Um, and... Uh, and so what I wanted to ask you, what are the circumstances of you meeting the Christmas bunya? Oh, well, uh, look, uh, uh, it was in the uh, Toowoomba office uh, where the Farm and Rural Legal Service at that stage was located, both of us, mm. Lee Neverson and myself, we were both there, and... Uh, Apparently, it was a custom to have the Christmas fairy come in and, uh, you know, dish out presents and whatnot. And uh, I was the newest person there, I think, and I said, well, you, you'll have to be the Christmas fairy. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to be a fairy. 
I'm not going to be a Christmas fairy. And I thought about it and I said, I'll be a bunyip. I'll be a Christmas bunyip. And, uh, yeah, well, I, I uh, enjoyed that. Uh, you know, it uh, went went for some years. Uh, and I, I, I recall the bunyip being very naughty. Well, you know, I, I, I suppose I had a few vaguely risque jokes. And, uh, vaguely? Yes, uh, <laughs> And a, and a song or two, and uh, oh, can you sing us a Christmas bunny of a song? I can't remember what. Oh, oh no, come no, on! No. Yes, you can, Peter Cousins. I don't know whether I can. To tell to tell you the truth, I'll have to think about that. I, uh, uh, I know I I used to always, um, uh, but because bunny eat uh, eat roots, shoots, and uh, and of course leaves. <laughs> uh, I always used to, I always bring always used to bring some uh, roots in for the uh, for the people. Which were, uh, you know, a bag of carrots, and uh, I, I know uh, I can always remember dishing these roots out, <laughs> uh, which uh, I think some people blushed at, but most people seem to be quite delighted. Uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, so it's, oh, it went over the head of others. Yeah, yeah. It, may, it may well, have, it may well have done, and that's just as well, I suppose. Uh, but as far as the songs are concerned, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I know I had a lot of stories, and I, I used to, uh, uh... Now, I drew a portrait of the Christmas bunyip, I thought, at some stage, and we had it above the photocopier. Or was it maybe just a portrait of you? I can't remember. And after you retired, it disappeared, and we want to know whether or not you've got it. No. No, oh, what a no. shame. No, haven't. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it's, we lost a lot of your, because one of the things that we really liked about you was um, when you used to roll call or say that you were leaving for the day, you always used to either write a little poem or... Yeah. And we kept, I kept all those for many years and then they were archived and now they've disappeared. So, yeah, so these were all about um, Jumbucko Eel Nero, uh, mm. the uh, the black sheep farmer, or the black, the black sheep... Uh, uh, son of a uh, of a, a count of count uh, count Lego de Lambo, who uh, <laughs> who had uh, who had the the islands of Lambo and uh, Gucci Mudlow in uh, in the Mortana Bay. Uh, yeah, look, I, I enjoyed all that. That, uh, was, good, that was good fun. Uh, was yeah. it, wasn't there something about the Brema River? Barema, the, yeah. the Barema, <laughs> the Barema. Yes, the Barema. <laughs> yes, and the. <laughs> And the savage oysters which used to come and hunt in packs. Yes, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Good stuff, yeah. We miss that. We really do. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Um, Peter, what do you think was um, one of the best things your law degree or your legal career gave you? Legal aid. Oh, that's oh. so nice. Well, really. Mm. And, uh, it's yeah. a special place, I think, legal yeah, aid. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's right. And... Uh, yeah, and I, I also really enjoyed that um, AAT stuff that I did. Oh, that's yeah. true, because for a number of years there, you were the only one doing the socials, the Social Security Appeals um, Advice Clinic that we had at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, mm. which I think was a very important um, part of our practice and, and has been expanded since Good. you've gone. But it's... Um, I think you provided a lot of uh, support and advice to people who were struggling with the system. Well, we did very well with all our appeals that uh, you know yep. argued in the uh, in the AAT. Uh, we did very well indeed, and uh, yeah, it's got to have helped people. Mm. Oh yeah, well it did. You now we've got two two people. lawyers doing it: um, Catherine Ewer and Bryony Walters. Really? Yes, uh, and they're very successful. They and we also. Um, expanded the um, practice to the first tier, the Social Security and Child Support Division, the oh, yeah. first one, yeah. um, because what we were seeing was only being in the general division is that people were struggling for 18 months mm. or longer by the time they got to the AAT and we thought if we mm. could get to them mm. you went, you in went, the earlier yeah. stages they wouldn't be struggling financially for as long yeah. if they got... We, we tried, advice. but I can't remember why we failed. Oh, they wouldn't let us in. Do you remember? Yeah, they wouldn't. And I let think us, Jim yeah. Gibney um, ultimately yeah. he did a 
reconnaissance trip to New South Wales where they were allowing New South Wales, mm. Legal Aid New South Wales into the first mm. tier of the mm. AAT and found out all the information and then come, came back and did a submission to the Brisbane Registry. Mm. And it was after that that we were able to um, do uh, oh, well, advice it's, 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 it's good that, that It's good that that happened, mm. yeah, yeah, because it, it was something which would have been good, been very yeah. timely, yeah. Mm. And we've the practice has expanded and we now do... National Disability Insurance Scheme uh -huh, appeals uh -huh. in okay. the AAT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, so we should. So we should. Yep. Mm. I agree. Uh, yeah, it's... And that's a, an area that um, Loretta and I practice. Oh, well, Loretta's not in it anymore, but Loretta mm. was one of the... Oh, you and I were the first lawyers at Legal Aid to start doing the NDIS appeals. Well, mm -hmm. the first lawyers probably in the state. In the state, yes, probably. Yeah, because <laughs> there was... When we came along, the legislation was very new and they only started giving money to people in Queensland. In 2016. Yeah, and that's when we started doing the work. So every case that we ran was pretty um, pretty novel. Yeah, and we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> so I'm sure you did. it brings I'm sure us you back did. to it where you were in 1965 when you went down to surface <laughs> and not know yeah. what you're doing it's uh, it's it's challenging when you're in that situation isn't it yes yes yeah, that's right i'll say it is but uh, um fortunately you have a stenographer in the office who knows more than you do and uh yeah oh uh, well we didn't <laughs> but anyway but it's sometimes uh, i was actually going to make a comment about that it's we always relied on our administrative support, particularly yes. years and years ago. Um, and it's probably changed a little bit because those people are not, because often now the administrative support that we have can be people who are studying law and they'll leave. Whereas in those days, you had people who were there 20, 30 years mm -hmm. doing this type of work. They knew mm -hmm. more about the processes, certainly when you first started, mm. then the lawyers did, mm. certainly in my mm. case. And yeah, one, yeah, of, yeah. one of those was Lorraine mm. Pinchorn, who was oh, a, yes. a superior example of the wonderful support and knowledge that you can have in a administrative support mm. person. Mm. And she's only recently retired. Has she? Mm. Yeah. Hey. There you have it. And the other thing that I was going to, finally, I was going to ask you a question that even though you said you hated it, and it was one of the reasons why you left private practice, and that was your um, the requirement that you had to go and build these relationships to bring money into mm. the firms. Mm. What it, the question that I always ask people because I'm interested in it myself because everybody has a different way of doing mm. this. Mm. What were some of the things that you thought really worked well in terms of building relationships? Now I'm not just talking about to bring money in, but or oh, you know even in the legal aid context. And that you didn't mind, that you enjoyed? Well, mm. finding, trying to establish um, relationships where you had a common interest with, uh, with, with the people concerned mm. that you could both enjoy, uh, I suppose, and uh, appreciate each other because of your common interest. I, I think, you know, friendship, mm. true friendship, does it exist? True friendship rather than, you know, false friendship that's purely based on what dollars. You, or what yeah. you can do for each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's how I think it, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and those relationships take time. They do take time, yeah. Yeah, yeah because yeah. you have to build up trust over a long period of time. Yeah, it's yeah. not something... You, that cannot, you can't go in and, uh, well, maybe you do it these days, I don't know, and elbow your way in and, uh, yeah... You can't. I know when I left um, the practice that I was at at uh, Service Gulf Coast, uh, I uh, yeah, promised that I wouldn't be taking any clients with me. Uh, there was a particularly very large client uh, who I understand was uh, absolutely disgusted when I left. But however, uh, one of the jobs which I went along to try to get after I left and failed of course uh, told me that they would systematically work this particular client that I had left until they got him and then you know I'd have him again uh, you know I, I 
the, uh, that was one reason I think why uh, I, I think I was actually made an offer by that particular firm, and uh, I think I gave it a miss <laughs> for that reason. Ethical. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah. Uh, mm. no, Interesting. Uh, do you, uh, actually, that's the last question I might end up on. Do you think ethical practice has changed over the years? Well, as far as I can see, it's changed drastically. Yeah. yeah look, you know, the, 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 mm -hmm. it's um, no longer, well, it is a profession, but it's uh, mm. not quite as, not quite a, as such a profession as it used to be. It's, uh, you know, what are we? A hell of a lot of, just a lot, a lot of glorified salespeople with a particular knowledge. Mm. Uh, it's sales, isn't it, these days? I think. It's, well, of course, part, it's sales. Part of it is selling, yeah. Well, sure. it is sales. I mean, uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, legal aid isn't, but uh, how do you get your clients for uh, for litigation, your personal injury clients? You have a, a, a bloody huge uh, advertising campaign on uh, on the television, don't you? Apparently. Mm. I don't know what you. I don't know what you have if you don't. If you don't have one of those, I don't know what you have. But that's selling, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it appears to me that it's selling. They must have a different idea. Well, it certainly changed from the genteel profession of the um, of when you started. And I do yes, remember, I do recall um, in my early years of practice having a phone call with somebody on the other side and the um, person on the other side said, I'm going to quote what you said in court. I'm going to use this. And I was so shocked and I went to my principal and said, oh, I've really stuffed up on this particular phone call. She goes, oh, well, we'll see. And she rang the partner from the other side and there was a big hullabaloo. And I never spoke to that lawyer again. So she must have got into so much trouble because yeah. it was just a given that you would have without prejudice conversations. I don't know whether mm -hmm. um, that would be treated in the same way these days if you were having those conversations. I don't think it would be. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, it, mm. I, don't, I don't think it would be, but it certainly... But is that something, be. because we? I didn't know about that either, is it something about the way that we're teaching young, uh, you know, teaching people, or is it... Is it I'm sure it is, mm. and I'm, I, I feel that it's probably because... Uh, the, well, you just told me that there were no articles, but uh, I think certainly the five-year articles uh, made a big difference at the time because most of the solicitors in good old Brisbane at the time that I did law had done the five-years articles because the university degree hadn't been there for, for such a long time, I don't think. Uh, and even after that, you had to do... Three years articles, I believe. Oh, two. Two? two was that all yeah. it was? Yeah, I did two years. Oh, I thought it was three. Yeah, well, there you are. Okay, but I, I think that um, I think that at the time we had such a lot of camaraderie, I, I think, amongst the... And it was smaller, too. Mm. The, the profession was so much smaller. Uh, and they'd all been through it together doing their, doing their articles, running down to the... Supreme Court and the Stamps Office and the Titles Office and meeting all the funny people who, who inhabited those places uh, <laughs> and all having similar experiences. <laughs> you know, and it, I, I think that formed a basis of, well, camaraderie you had a, you had and a trust. Bond. Yes, yeah. yes, you, you, yeah. So you build that relationship over many years of shared experiences yes. and therefore you were able to trust each other when you spoke to them. In, in the interests of your clients. Mm. And that I, I think we've lost that because we wouldn't know any of the solicitors necessarily that we're speaking to mm. that, are, mm. that are acting for the other party on the matter. And I think because nationally mm. um, you, you could, any of the government agencies these days that we might deal with with legal mm. aid will be briefing lawyers and you could, I, I'm dealing with lawyers who are in Western Australia mm. um, or South Australia or Victoria mm. and they're, they're running the matter that's in the Brisbane Registry of the AAT. So mm. it's not like I have even any chance of ever knowing these people and mm. I may never deal mm. with them again. It's like it's because of technology 
They can be anywhere in the oh, country. Technology. And the other reason for that, uh, I was just thinking about those, some of the different law societies have different expectations as to what they, how they think the profit, even though we've got national rules, mm. I still think that there's a difference between each of the jurisdictions as to mm. what they think is model behaviour of solicitors. Mm. Um, it's interesting. Or, you know, where they'll be more relaxed. Perhaps, yeah. Brisbane, of course, was always a little bit sleepy than uh, Sydney and uh, things and, like that too. And Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and Melbourne, yeah. the, the story that I relayed was from Western Australia. So it was still quite a small profession, I think, for the mm. same reason. It, mm. it, because it was small, it had that people knew each other and you just, you were really taught that. Mm. that there was a standard of... of of mm. practice and behaviour and conduct that was expected. Mm. Mm. Which, I, yeah, which I I, don't, I think it's just because we're bigger. Um, I think it's because we um, don't know each other that well, so we don't build the trust. Yeah. And I wonder whether that's really reflected. And like you said, I mean, when you couldn't even say as an article clerk when you were walking down the street where you worked for, mm. because it was seen as advertising, it's just a different world altogether. Mm. Lumpkin Gronick wanted a tonic for to make him happy. These Valium pills will cure your ills, said Dr. Grippy Grappy. So he swallowed the lot, the lid and the pot, but he didn't feel any better. Then right after dark, he started to bark, and by dawn he'd become a red setter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there anything more that you wanted to say, Peter? Oh, I don't. I don't think so. I think you've covered everything there. Fiona? Marvellous. No, no. <laughs> All right. Okay. Marvellous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for sparing the time to talk to me. If you want to find out more about Peter, there are show notes with, with each of my episodes, including contact details for each of my guests on my website, www.lorettacreek.com. Please drop me a line if you have any questions or know of someone who may, may be interested in being interviewed for the podcast. Thank you. And until next time. Cheerio. Oh, yeah.